and a, a lot of um, insights that are coming through there. And based on your extensive experience in terms of the scoring and the grading of, of these buildings and, and um, the energy consumption thereof, what are some of those solutions that property investors can implement, you know, um, in order for them to maintain a favorable rating and for them to, to get to, to having a very good rating in terms of their APC? Don't have an EPC, you could face 5 million rand fine, or even worse, jail time. Are you worried whether your building is green enough, or you should, you, you should be? In this episode, our expert guest will, will help you understand the ins and outs of the energy performance certificates. From the expert's mouth to your ears, these are property insights you don't want to miss. This is the Private Property Podcast. I'm Dumi. Welcome. Join the conversation tonight on Facebook by dropping your comments below and you could stand a chance to win 500 Rand cash. See competition details in the description. all this without wearing a cape. That's quite a task there, Freaky. Viewers at home, give me a, help me give a warm welcome to the Head of Sustainability at Remote Metering Solutions, Freaky Malan. Freaky, good evening and thank you so much for joining us. Kimi, thank you for inviting me to participate in the show. I'm really looking forward to uh, tonight and to discuss the latest or one of the, the trending topics in the energy space, energy performance certification for uh, buildings. Thank you so much. You know, really, really appreciate it. Um, jumping straight in, is it true that without an EPC, um, one could face 5 million rand fine or even jail time? To me, yes, there, there is um, <clears throat> sort of some, how can I say, validity in that statement, but we've got to unpack it a little bit. Um, the first thing to understand is that not all buildings need an EPC. Um, in terms of the regulations that were published in December 2020, only four occupancy classes of buildings need EPCs. Um, so, so these are your G1 offices, um, A1, the A1 occupancy class, which is places of entertainment and public assembly. A2, which is um, theatrical and indoor sports. So it's places where people would gather to watch indoor sports or theatrical performances. And A3, which is places of instruction like colleges and schools and universities. So for instance, um, homeowners don't belong to any of those occupancy classes and they don't need to have an EPC on their, on their houses. Um, in, if, you, if you're a property owner and you own a, a shopping center, a shopping center is also not one of those four listed occupancy classes. So um, unless your building belongs to one of those four occupancy classes, that's one of the um, uh, criteria to decide whether you need an EPC. And the other one is the building size. So if your building is owned by, uh, is privately owned, then the building must be larger than 2,000 square meters. If it's owned or occupied or operated by what is referred to as an organ of state, then that size threshold is 1,000 square meters. So it's interesting that you know, government owned buildings, um, the, the size threshold is actually smaller than privately owned buildings. Um, so generally speaking, by all accounts, estimates, sort of general consensus in the market, there's between 200,000 and 300,000 buildings in South Africa that, that do need an EPC. And um, it's worth mentioning that the deadline 
for achieving your compliance with the EPC regulations is actually this December, December 2022. So there's not a lot of time left to get your EPC if you don't have one yet. And if you obviously belong, if, if your building belongs to those occupancy classes, and if it's larger than the 2000 square meters. Sure. Someone is already watching us tonight and maybe is a property investor or even belongs to that category that you mentioned, but is still wondering what is an EPC and how do I obtain it? You know, let's just uh, delve into what it is and um, what it entails and how does one obtain it if they already have a building that sits in one of those categories? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to just go back to my one of my opening remarks where I said it, um, where I mentioned that there were regulations published in 2020 um, that effectively brought EPCs into law. So it is legislated and um, you know, non-compliance with the regulations means that you are uh, transgressing the National Energy Act, which then could lead to the fines, which was your first question. Um, so, so effectively, what is an EPC? It is a piece of paper, <laughs> is the simple answer, <laughs> with a writing on it, from A to G, where A is a very efficient building and G is a building that's uh, not terribly efficient. Um, I think the closest analogy is if you look at, if you these days, if you buy a fridge or a washing machine or whatever, most of them have these stickers on the side that also um, has this writing that is an indication of the energy efficiency of that appliance. Now, an EPC is pretty much that same kind of sticker if you want that is applied to a building so an a like i said denotes a building that is very energy efficient and a g would be a building that's not efficient the middle range is more or less a d so so what that means is uh, an epc is calculated by determining the total energy consumption of a building over a 12-month period um, that is typically called the year of assessment and that is that that total kilowatt hour energy consumption is then um, normalized by the building size. So in other words, you, you just divide the total energy consumption by the building size. Obviously, larger buildings will consume more energy than, than smaller buildings. And that answer that you get is compared to a national standard. It's SANS 10400 XA. Um, there's a 2011 version and a more recent 2021 version. And depending on how your building stacks up against that reference consumption gives you the A or the B or the C or the D or whatever rating your building gets. Um, it's also useful maybe to mention that an EPC is valid for a period of five years. So once you have an EPC for your building, you only need to revisit that building's performance and reissue the EPC after five years. Thank you so much for that and, and a, a lot of um, insights that are coming through there. And based on your extensive experience in terms of the scoring and the grading of, of these buildings and, and um, the energy consumption thereof, what are some of those solutions that property investors can implement, you know, um, in order for them to maintain a favorable rating and for them to, to get to, to having a very good rating in terms of their APC? So I'm going to try not to get too technical because it's easy to go into something to a, an engineering rabbit hole or two. Yeah. But I think, you know, let's start at the type of buildings that, that qualify for EPCs. And I think, you know, in, in our experience, at least in, in the market that we're um, targeting, most of the buildings that we have done EPCs for are the office type building, near your commercial buildings. And in those buildings, your major energy consumers are typically your lighting and your um, air conditioning systems. So if you want to improve the performance of your building from an EPC point of view, you have to look at how can you reduce the energy consumption that is associated with either your lighting or your air conditioning systems in the building. And there's, there's a host of, call it energy efficiency interventions that a property owner can, can consider. Um, I think the key is what do you do to improve the building's performance that still gives you a good return on investment? And that's not always simple and um, you know I, I think any property owner who wishes to improve the portfolio uh, the performance of his building or his portfolio would do well to appoint a call it an energy efficiency subject matter expert to help him on this journey 
Um, one thing that I do want to mention is um, sort of a common assumption in the market that if you put solar PV on a building, which most people are doing these days um, for, for many reasons, not just efficiency, I think with load shedding being what it is, um, most people are looking at some kind of solution that will give them electricity when, well, when, when ESCOM is, when we're in a state of load shedding. Um, so so the, the common misconception is that if I've got solar PV on my building, my EPC rating will improve, um, but that's not correct because an EPC looks at the total energy consumption of a building. It does not really, from an EPC point of view, matter where the energy comes from, whether it's from ESCOM, whether it's from a diesel generator, or whether it's from a solar PV plant, it's still kilowatt hours. So, you know, you can even take a building off grid, it will still have the same EPC rating that it would have received if it was still connected to the grid, if the total amount of kilowatt hours uh, were not produced. Um, I hope that makes sense. No, thank you so much for that. Yes, and and it totally does in terms of what it is and how to how one can prepare for it. So let's let's talk about uh, let's talk more about the role that you are currently playing as the head of sustainability at Remote uh, Metering Solution. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what exactly you do? Yeah, Timmy, thank you. Um, so we're a new business unit within Remote Metering Solutions, and you know our mission is to help our clients to reduce their carbon footprint, improve the efficiency of their facilities, whether that's commercial or industrial. Um, but, you know, I, I think I'm, I used the word journey earlier and, and this kind of approach to really implement changes in a portfolio of buildings that, that are sustainable is a journey. It's not a one shot um, sort of silver bullet that, that can solve all your problems. And, and one of the most important steps in this journey is to understand where am I starting from? What is my current situation? And I think this is where EPCs also play an important role because an EPC is really a benchmark of a building's performance. Um, and you know, the, 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 the question isn't really, or it's not important whether a building is an A or a B or a C, or whatever the rating is. But the question to ask is rather, how do you improve the rating? What do you do to um, reduce the energy consumption of that building. And, and this is where we help our clients to develop, call it energy efficiency and renewable energy and sustainable, sustainability plans that span more than one year. It's not just about doing something this year and then you know your job is done. It's what do you do this year, what do you do the year thereafter, and how do you put this program together in such a way that the return on investment on the one hand and the environmental impact on the other hand is, is maximized. No, thank you so much for that, Ricky. And let's let's jump into um, the factors that are considered. When, as a specialist comes into your building, you are one of the people uh, whose building is in the categories, the four categories that you mentioned. You're either a school or a college or even a sports facility. Um, a, a specialist is walking into my building. What are the four factors that he or she is looking at in order for them to grade um, the to grade my, my energy consumption and which level of my e EPCs or how my APC is going to look rather. Okay, so, so when we determine the energy performance certification rating of a building, there's a number of factors that we take into account. Uh, the first is the total energy consumption of the building and I have to emphasize the word total. So we look at all the energy sources that are being used in the building. Um, that would be your grid electricity, and I think most people still rely on the grid. Um, your solar PV consumption, if you have a solar PV plant on your roof, we have to take into account how much diesel was consumed during that 12 month year of assessment. Um, and again, you know, most buildings these days do have some form of diesel backup, so that is quite an important energy source. Some buildings use gas, um, and even though that's not usually a significant contributor to the total energy consumption, we do have to take that into account. Um, the standards also make provision for solid fuels. Um, so I'm glad to say that so far, we haven't found any buildings that use coal, and I hope we don't, but that is always a possibility. And then we also look at any we also have to take into account any energy that might leave the building. So that's sort of a bit of a technical case 
But what I'm trying to say is the first factor is what is the net energy consumption of that building? So it's all the energy that's being used in the building minus the energy that could, for some reason or another, leave the building. Then I, I think I mentioned that um, the energy consumption is normalized for the size of the building. So there the standards refer to the net floor area, which is a very specific definition of the size of a building. So what we need to do that, what we need from a property owner to determine the net floor area is his um, building plans, um, which we then analyze and we uh, determine the net floor area. And then we also take into account things like what was the level of occupancy for the building. Now that's quite relevant um, given COVID and uh, building occupancy rates were definitely down, especially in the commercial sector. So um, if your year of assessment fell over the lockdown period, um, then, then it's something that we, that we do take into account. And then, uh, you know, just to sort of cross the T's and dot the I's, we also look at the operating hours of the building. You know, the assumption for an office building, for example, is that uh, the offices run 12 hours a day, five days a week. But let's say you have something like a call center that is operated 24 by 7. It is a factor that is going to influence the energy consumption and therefore the rating of the building, and we do need to take that into account. So, um, I guess that, that's sort of the, the big picture. Um, there's a lot of nitty gritty that I'm not getting into, but um, in short, we need to take into account all the energy consumption, all the energy consumers in the building or sources of energy, the net floor area and the building occupancy, and then the operating hours or the operating conditions of that building. Sure. If you just joined us, we are talking EPC certification and how you can ensure if you fall part of the, uh, the categories that make that that require EPC certificates to ensure that you don't get fined or even face jail time. So if you have questions or comments, do remember to send those to us so that Freaky can um, deal with them before we let him go tonight. Freaky, before before we start um, taking the questions on social media, I just want to ask a question quickly in terms of how can we quantify um, the saving or we the the goal is to save energy and we, we, may, we may know how much energy we have saved, but can we then quantify it in terms of um, the, the environment or how much um, carbon, uh, or ca carbon monoxide or even uh, pollution that we are saving um, in a year or even in a couple of years? Will we be able to know, or is this something that has been done in the industry to say we know how much, how much we have saved and how much damage we have saved or uh, uh, prevented from doing these exercises? Yes, yes, indeed. To me, um, no, I, I think the uh, notion of carbon footprinting for buildings and for, um, well, many types of buildings is, is quite well established. And a lot of people are helping property owners understand their carbon footprint, number one. And also, what if they take any measures to improve it, that carbon footprint, reduce the carbon footprint, you know, the, the mechanisms and methods to report on that is well established. And, um, yeah, so, so the relationship between, <clears throat> let's say, the kilowatt hours that a, a building consumes, the energy that the building consumes, and this depends on the, the source of energy and the carbon emissions associated with those kilowatt hours are known. So, you know, if a building's energy mix consists of... Um, you know, grid electricity and diesel and, and solar PV, the carbon footprint can be, can be determined. I think this is, I mean, I, I mentioned that solar PV and having a sort of a renewable energy in your energy mix doesn't affect the EPC, but it would obviously have a massive impact on your carbon footprint because all the kilowatt hours coming from a solar PV plant um, really has a zero carbon footprint. So, um, you know, a building that has, let's say, 30% of its power coming from, or its electricity coming from solar PV would have a, a lower carbon footprint than the same building that uses the same amount of kilowatt hours, but it's all coming from the grid. So these two buildings would have the same EPC rating, but the building with the solar PV would have a much lower carbon footprint. 
Thank you so much for that, Ricky. And folks, there you have it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. Um, it was a really informative uh, session, and we really, really um, appreciate you coming through and, and fielding those questions for us. If anybody is in those category of, of buildings or owns one, I believe, I bet you, they are going to be um, implementing one of those EPCs. Thank you so much for joining us, and have a good night. Thank you, Jimmy. Good night. Good night. So we are going to be taking a quick feature, which is something new that I am sure you are absolutely going to love. We are talking everything and everything um, energy. We, are, we, we come to you bringing you um, fast facts about energy. So tonight we are looking at these, uh, these particular fast facts. Energy efficient buildings have cleaner combustion and better ventilation than traditional buildings and energy efficient buildings reduce indoor air pollution. They also minimize outdoor pollution by reducing the fossil fuel pollution caused by power generation because, of, because they use less energy. Our second five fast facts for tonight is that reducing indoor and outdoor air pollutants can reduce the occurrence of illnesses like asthma, lung cancer, as well as the rate of premature deaths. Our third fun fact, building efficiency provides the most return on the investment in terms of reducing climate change and causing emissions, in addition to lowering infrastructure costs and household expenses. Number four, building efficiency improves regularly, regularly ha have a low cost or provide return on investment in the form of energy cost savings in as little as six, six months to a year. This is an indirect contrast to emission cutting investments in other sectors such as agriculture, transportation, which are either pretty expensive or result in decreased emission reductions. And number five, building cons buildings consume 40% of global energy and emit 33% of greenhouse gas emissions. Making new, builders, making new buildings sustainable and energy efficient will be critical to our efforts to combat climate change. Employees, bottom lines, and investors can all benefit from green buildings. That was our new fun fact. Hopefully, hopefully you guys enjoyed that segment. And I am going to be now telling you who won the most engagement for tonight's um, episode. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together as we welcome Glad Shirinda, who is the winner of tonight's 500 Rand cash prize. Congratulations to you, Glad Shirinda. Hopefully, you'll tell us in the comments what you're going to do with your prize. And that brings us to the end of our episode tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. We were talking um, EPCs tonight. And if you are, if you are in um, the this, this space and you are part of those categories, hopefully you now know what you need to do to ensure that your buildings are efficient. Till the next time we see you right here on the Private Property Podcast, 7 p.m. every weekday. Have a great night.